Hello everyone, I'm Chandler. I'm a second year XD. And I'm Danny. I'm also a second year XD. And we have the pleasure of introducing one of the most iconic XDs. Um, she's named a game changer by Forbes and one of the most creative people in the industry by Business Insider. Uh, Rachel Mercer is a Brand Center alum from the CT, but now XD Track. As an award-winning design and strategy leader, Rachel has spent over a decade working in and leading multidisciplinary teams to create groundbreaking products, services, and experiences. Rachel is now the co-founder and chief experience officer at Proto, an innovation consultancy which believes in the power of intersectional innovation where strategy, design, and execution coexist. And prior to Proto, Rachel served as VP and head of strategy at RGA's New York office, where she led the CX and future visions for clients like Verizon, Ally Financial, Beam, um, Suntory, Michaels, and Unilever. Uh, but before RGA, she was leading digital transformation and consulting projects at Deutsch, The Upside, and Made by Many. Uh, you could say that She's done pretty well in the real world since leaving Brand Center, but don't just take our word for it. Rachel's here to keep it real, giving us the inside scoop on what she learned from each of her roles. So with that, i uh, hand it over to you, Rachel. Wow, thank you for such a generous introduction, guys. And it's always good to be back with family, as uh, Kaylee was saying at the very beginning. So uh, I did a lot of thinking about what you guys would actually want to hear about. And I'll be, I'll be um, transparent. I was a little bit nervous because I know what tough critics you guys can be. Uh, so this might be the first handmade presentation that you guys will have seen uh, throughout the process. But what I really wanted to do was think about what are the things that are most applicable to you guys. So I started out thinking about like, what are the types of things that I should really cover uh, that would be like practical and useful advice for you? Should I talk about the big integrations that I've done? Uh, should I talk about the innovation work and physical products? Should I talk about how to make meaningful campaigns or even doing things like uh, corporate strategy? But you know, as uh, both a creative and a strategist at heart, I talked to a bunch of different people around uh, what they felt like would be most useful. I thought about the context that we're in. I know that you guys are racing towards recruiter session uh, just a week away. And so most of the people I talked to really said that the most interesting thing and the most useful thing uh, about my experience was that I have a sort of background working at very different types of companies. And, and I think taking those different types of learnings and making sure to make them applicable for you guys uh, was really key. So anything from really big, gigantic integrated agencies and even global networks like RGA and Crispin Porter and Bogusky to mid-sized agencies on both coasts um, working at Deutsch twice to much smaller innovation consultancies like Made by Many and The Upside. And then of course, we're um, in the middle of starting up Proto. Now, uh, earlier in this presentation, I think Emma was saying that uh, you guys are all very interested in Proto. Unfortunately, what I decided not to do was give you guys like a 101 on how we're building a company because I didn't think that any of you guys would necessarily be leaving and starting a company tomorrow. But I'm definitely here, happy to talk about it um, and happy to talk about those things um, along the way. Um, but I felt like the three things that I could really help you guys with were uh, the, the things that might be top of mind for you guys now. So uh, how do you get the job uh, that you wanna get? When you start, what are the things that you should really think about and do? And of course, I'll tell you from the perspective that really worked for me. And then finally, how do you sustain in that job? Um, and, and really the things that I've learned uh, most critically, especially in the last couple of years. Um, and I'm gonna caveat this with a couple of things, right? This is gonna be what's worked for me. This is what's worked for me in the last decade. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's gonna have to be true to you. So think about it a little bit like your horoscope or a tarot card reading, take what is meaningful for you and then leave everything else on the table. Cause sometimes you read a horoscope for your day and you're like, this is not gonna be my day. And that's totally fine. Um, so first and most importantly, the thing that's on everybody's mind, and it's not just jobs, it's going to be true for internships as well. What were the things that were helpful for me um, in framing and getting the job sort of each and every time? 
Um, the first is really making sure that you identify what you feel like your unique and individual value proposition is going to be for somebody. Now, I, I don't know how much you guys know about me, but I originally went to undergrad for graphic design. I'd actually worked in the industry for a couple of years doing anything from uh, architecture to digital design. And part of why I went to Brand Center was because I felt like I really wanted to diversify my experience. Actually, I also went to Brand Center because I applied to advertising agencies like no less than 45 times, Arnold Worldwide, Mullen, um, a, a number of design agencies in Boston. And they were all like, we don't understand how to use a, a sort of graphic design background. So I chose to come to Brand Center for a very specific reason. And I chose the CT track as a way to start to diversify my experience. And so the way that I positioned myself when I was graduating um, and again, this is unique for me, was that I felt like I really worked at the intersection of strategy and design and technology. So I could go to a hiring manager or a recruiter or a creative director and say, listen, I really understand and I speak design. Your art director doesn't have to hold my hand in terms of making comps or those types of things. Um, I have a foundational understanding of the backend technologies. So I'm not gonna make a suggestion like, hey, we should set up drone deliveries when it's not something that's gonna be feasible and possible for your company. And strategy being that I'm always taking a sort of human first mindset to how we're applying these things or making sure that it's uh, relevant and applicable to your brand. So that, that was how I happened to position myself. Every one of you is unique in your own way. So you'll have your own sort of background experiences, values that you bring to the table. But I think crystallizing that is really important, whether you're talking about an internship or you're talking about that full-time role. The second is to really try and make that your calling card. And one of the most like underutilized things um, for most people is the sort of add connection button on LinkedIn and the 300 characters that you have there to use. Um, so, and this is something that has paid off for me time and again, where I'll, you know, reach out to a recruiter at a company that I want to work for. That's just like, hey, I noticed that you work at so-and-so company. If you're ever looking for and play your own game of uh, mishmash with words like uh, technology leader that understands brands, uh, experience leader that understands business, any of those types of combinations, just let me know. And there's been a lot of times that there's not an opportunity right now, but there's almost always something in the future and you've planted the seed in their mind where they can think about when to, to sort of bring you up. And especially like, at an internship level, if you're showing a level of um, enthusiasm or things that you're eager to do, that's oftentimes a great way to be able to uh, start that initial outreach, if that makes sense. And I think an important note about this is that every single connection counts. Um, so it's easy to look at right now, and I'm gonna talk through the recruiter session lens, you're gonna look out at the recruiters and you're gonna be like, I, and, and I don't know if this is the case, I, I only want to go to Widen and I only care about Widen and these three other places. It's actually really helpful to have as many conversations as possible because again, it's, it's not like those people stay at that one company for their whole career. The average turnover in this industry is 24 months. So a recruiter one day at a company that you're not necessarily a fan of, like a VML YNR or whatever, is going to eventually be at a company that you maybe want to work for. Um, and that's, again, continued to pay dividends for me where I'll reach out and I'll make connections. I, I tried to take as many meetings as possible rather than sort of reduce um, opportunities for myself. I saw these as very much an opportunity to plant the seeds that could pay off for myself over time. And so I had a recruiter that I used that tactic on at AKQA where there wasn't a role or there wasn't an opportunity, but she eventually went on to Nike and to Widening Kennedy and every time she reached out again for a role because she was like, okay, I remember that Rachel is that um, strategic creative technologist. We might have a need for that here and in this place and in this time. Next is um, I think really trying to understand for you what that area is that you want to both play and grow in. So um, do you want to be at in-house or an agency? Do you want to be in a big shop? And that's like being in a big shop means that you're kind of kind of going to be told what to do and you're going to have one very specific job. Do you want to be at a small shop where you're going to wear many, many hats and you're going to get your hands dirty in many things? Do you want to feel like you're more of um, a family vibe or do you want to sort of have some of the security of that? And it doesn't have to necessarily even be about the shop 
itself. It can also be about like the type of brands that you want to work on. Um, I feel like a lot of people will dismiss and say, I only want to work on a Nike or something like that. But sometimes being at the top of the pyramid means that the only place that you can go is down. So I always personally love working on a challenger brand in a category rather than the leader, because to me, that means there's nowhere to go but up. And then finally, uh, thinking about what you want being sort of a breadth of experience or a depth of experience. So for me, what was really beneficial when I first took my job at Deutsch in LA, I was able to sort of play a jack of all trades role. I, I joined this team that was called Invention. Um, that was really gonna let me do both the prototyping and the design and the strategy pieces together. But after I did that job for a couple of years, I was like, I really need to focus in and figure out how to be, sorry, Kaylee, a strategist. <laughs> and so I specifically focused on uh, trying to find a role where I could actually get good at that craft because being that jack of all trades, master of none, sort of didn't pay off, uh, wouldn't pay off in my career in the end. Um, and then finally, again, when you're thinking about roles, per per those personal connections trump uh, those portals or those like generic application sites every single time. Uh, so LinkedIn is a super powerful tool. Um, it's often very underutilized. So find a way to use it. And there's a number of different ways that you can um, use this. Again, even if there's not a role right now, but there's a creative director that you love or a person um, whose career you're interested in following, uh, don't be afraid to um, connect with them. The search function is actually really versatile where you can add in things like, I want to see people who work at um, this type of agency or in this location who have gone to VCU Brand Center. That level of specificity is available to you. Um, and so there's ways that you can reach out in that regard. And then there's also, uh, you, if you are nervous about sort of adding anyone to your network because you're like, I don't, I feel like they're too senior, they might not be immediately relevant or those types of things. Uh, the follow button is incredibly useful also too for uh, once you have an understanding of the companies that you want to work for as well. Because then what it will, what LinkedIn will do is they'll automatically surface job opportunities, you'll see what types of things that agency is doing on a regular basis. So it's a really great way to be able to keep your finger uh, on the pulse. And again, for me, it's just continued to pay a lot of dividends over time. Um, and then I think finally, there's, uh, it's important to think about every role as the foundation for what you want to do in the next role. So don't just think too much about like, what is this exact internship or this exact agency that I work want to work at right now? But think about what is this company going to give me? What experience is this going to give me that's going to help me round things out? Um, and I would ask yourself questions like, do you want to work at those big companies or do you not? Does it align with the work that you want to do? And does it help to diversify my experience? Again, for me, when I was evaluating internships, this is crazy to say, but Dro <laughs> Droga 5 at the time was less than 100 people and they, only off they offered me an internship, but they only offered me um, like a subway card <laughs> and like $100 a week or something like that. Whereas Crispin, I'd only worked at small local agencies to date. Crispin had been sort of a big brand name. They had a really established internship program. They had a really established craft. So I was able to say, okay, this internship experience at Crispin, while Droga is very cool, um, is going to offer me sort of the type of thing that I need that will legitimize me for as I think about uh, the jobs uh, going forward. And I know that that will be key for some of you as well as you're uh, graduating and getting ready for the world. So if you want your career to be sort of formed around small shops or independent work or those types of things, uh, think about uh, what the implications for each thing are for you. Um, so let's say you've gone through this whole process and um, Rachel Mercer's formula for success is amazing and you've gotten the interview. Uh, so now what are the things that you need to do? Um, of course, and this is pretty obvious, make sure that you do your homework, not just on the agency, but also on the person. I think a lot of times when I'm personally interviewing people and I ask them what they think about uh, the work that our GA has done or um, a specific account, when they don't have an opinion on it, um, that's usually a big red uh, sort of flag for me. So I think making sure you have a firm understanding of why you want to work for them and what, what those motivations are 
is really key. And then when you do that research on the person, it gives you a lot of fodder, typically, again, through LinkedIn, to be able to understand what types of questions you should be asking them. Ask them questions about, it says you leave this account. Um, you've only been at this company for six months. What have your first impressions been of it? There's a number of things that you can start to ask that um, give you some things to ask for that are beyond the generic and will help you stand out um, in that process. I think it's also important to just take a minute to put yourself in their shoes. And this is true in like all things in life, but remember that the 30 minutes that you have with them is, is probably jam packed between a million Zooms um, and those sorts of things. So just make sure that you have maybe a couple of objectives that you're aligned to at the beginning that you like, what are the things you want them to leave and be able to say about you, knowing that they probably interviewed you and 10 other people that day. So that goes all the way back to what I was telling you guys at the very beginning for that value proposition. Like, what are the three things I want somebody to leave this interview? Um, and, and, and say about me, uh, if they're talking about me with someone else. And I think this is easy to get sort of lost in right now as everyone's like, ah, I got to get this job or I've got to get this internship. But I think remember that there's really two sides to consider here. It's, it's not just if you're a fit for them um, and you, you can do all you want to try and um, fit yourself into the mold that they might be looking for, but make sure it's something that, that feels like a fit for you and is true for you and is something that you're uh, looking for, ready for, seeking out in your career. Like taking a job at um, a sweatshop company that doesn't feel quite right might not be the right thing for you to do uh, early on and those types of things. And so I would leave some of this remembering that you should trust your gut and trust the feeling that you have when you leave that conversation with them. Because if you have bad juju to start, if you have bad vibes to start, it's not going to stop. It's going to be a lot harder uh, as you continue on. And so this sort of leaves me with my, I think this is my last um, recommendation in this section, which is I, I a thousand percent recommend choosing uh, the people that you're going to work for over the place and the name on the door. And this was very true for me when I took that first job at Deutsch. That was a big leap of faith for me. I honestly I had not heard of Deutsch as an agency when I first talked to them, um, but there was this guy who was working there who I'd followed on the internet for a long time. His name was um, Bud Cadell, and I, I was a pain in the ass to poor Ashley Summerdahl, and I was like, there's two people I want to be my mentor. I want it to be Kim Lama at AKQA, and I want um, Bud Cadell, who's currently at this place called Deutsch. And um, Deutsch had me come in and do a roundabout interview. And I, um, I just left feeling good about all of the people that I'd met and that I was working with. And that absolutely trumped every other opportunity that was sort of out there on the table. There was, you know, my, my parents are still mad that I did not take a job at Coca-Cola. Um, when I was like, I do not want to wear suits. This is not going to be the same uh, sort of thing. And, and trusting that gut instinct at the very beginning around these are the right people for me to be working with paid off over time because that really sets the foundation that really sets um, the definition for what your sort of experience is going to be. That makes sense. Ah, I forgot about this. Um, when it comes to negotiation, make sure to do your homework, but don't go crazy. <laughs> So uh, I th I've heard about a lot of people who sort of shoot themselves in the foot because right now um, everyone is talking about, you know, what your worth is, what your value is going in, making sure you negotiate to get that money um, really hard. And, and oftentimes once a company has made you an offer, they don't have a lot of flexibility in, in that offer. They've gone through like 10 steps on their end to make that happen. If that hiring manager has had to go to a finance person who's had to sign off on something with the COO who's now bringing it back. So if you um, try to negotiate for too much um, in, in those stages, it, it's just going to make it a little bit harder for them. Uh, so don't be upset if, if you hear about somebody who's making more money than you, there's always going to be somebody making more money than you. And I know that's not always fair to say it's happened to me where I've had, I've, had people under me making more money than me. Um, but, but don't always necessarily look at other people to, to, and have that ascribe the value to you. 
There are a lot of really good resources, um, whether it's Glassdoor, Real Agency Salaries Spreadsheet, Fishbowl, or even the AIGA, uh, especially for the art directors and experienced designers in the room. Um, that was really helpful, again, for me when I first took my uh, role at Deutsch, where um, the recruiter, of course, asked, how much money do you want to make? And I was able to say, you know, I looked at the uh, AIGA salary uh, survey. Uh, it says that user experience designers are making anywhere between sixty-five dollars and $75,000. Given that I have a couple of years of experience, I think you should pay me $70,000. And that meant that I was paid a little bit more than some of my peers, but there were also peers who were making eighty dollars or $90,000 because they went to uh, a different type of shop for a different type of experience. And that's okay, that's their choices. I made the choices that were sort of right for me. That makes sense. Um, if the big sticking point for you is money, have, uh, and this is a um, acronym, I'm sorry, but it's a best alternative to the negotiated agreement. And there's a lot of things that, they're, that they can sort of help you out with that the recruiters can give you um, flexibility on. There's things like a learning stipend. Can you help me pay for classes? Do I get um, to go to different conferences or those types of things because a lot of people are starting working from home. Do I get a work from home stipend to, you know, actually get a desk or, um, you know, get the supplies that I need and those types of things. Can you give me, you know, a few companies do signing bonuses, even if they can't negotiate on your base salary, they might say, we really like you and we want you to get started um, now. So you do have some flexibility. Again, just try to um, be reasonable in where you're going. And then finally, I think this is a, a really important thing that I also only learned recently, uh, that not getting the job isn't a bad thing. So when I was in London, I was in a job that I was really unhappy with. I had my eye on Ogilvy Consulting because I was like, I want to be a consultant. I want to do innovation. I got brought in and I did uh, a number of interviews with their head of consulting and their head of strategy. And they had me come in and do a case study. And um, similar to this, I was like, I'm not going to bring them a big polished presentation. I actually drew out the whole presentation on sheets of paper, brought it in and walked them through it on the table. And I got this really stiff email from them just saying, you know, we've gone with another um, person overall. And I, I spent years, I tell you years, beating myself up about it, being like, I, I don't know why I did that. I am just a crazy person. I can't believe I thought that was good. And um, no joke, five years later, that head of strategy uh, like sent me a note that was like, that was one of the best case studies we'd ever seen. We just thought you were too creative for the role. We needed somebody who was going to like fit that role a little bit more square because it was going to be on something like British gas or, or, or things like that. And so I, I think understanding that if it's not the right fit for them. That's not necessarily a value statement on you. It doesn't mean that you do bad work. It just means maybe for, you know, this telecom company or for this client, we need a different and a very specific type of person all of the, all of the time. So again, um, don't get too discouraged in this process or think that because you don't get a role, it doesn't mean that you're good at what you're doing. Um, and then did I lose? Hold up. Yep, okay. I accidentally deleted something, so we're gonna put it back here. All right. I skipped. Um, so we talked a little bit about getting the job, but let's say you've gotten the job and you're gonna start, what are the things that you need to do to really, again, make sure to stand out? I think the important thing to remember is nobody knows you at all. And this is true in every single job that you're gonna take. This is not like, I, Rachel Mercer does not walk in and people are like, oh my God, Rachel Mercer, like nobody cares. <laughs> and so I think it's important to make sure like you're, they don't know your book, your background, what you're good at, what you're bad at. And so make sure that that's something that you take on as, as something that you can teach other people. Make sure it's in your introductory email, make those things that are known really early because nobody's gonna know that, you know, you're secretly really good at deck making or you're a great presenter or you're a um, excellent at doing comps or those types of things unless you volunteer that information early and um, often. 
And so there's a couple of things that really help. Um, and, and what I always recommend when starting a job, and again, this is any job, is setting up one-on-ones with your core team, get to know them very quickly, especially now when I'm sure everybody is starting remote. That like 30 minutes to an hour on Zoom is really critical just so they can get to know you a little bit as a person and it puts you top of line. Um, one of the things that I like to do is try to ask them like, what's going well on this account and what's not working? Cause that immediately helps me understand um, where I can start to help them. And I, I start that conversation with them early cause you've just started the job and you're, you're ready to go. Um, you're completely refreshed from uh, all this time from brand center, but that that's the best way to get sort of plugged in and, and sort of put to use early rather than sitting and waiting to be told what to do. Cause especially now when we're on Zoom or on Slack all the time, um, it's very easy to get lost in the shuffle or very easy to get forgotten. Um, and managers themselves are often very busy in the work um, for you guys. Uh, the next thing I really recommend is making sure you spend a little bit of time getting smart. Um, and, and these are things that end up, again, continuing to pay dividends over time. So the client and not just, um, not just like, hey, I'm working for Google right now, but like get a Google alert set up for that chief marketing officer or the five leaders in the company following them on Twitter. Sometimes I turn notifications on for them, those types of things. That's really helpful so that I can always be like a little bit in the know on what's happening on, on the company. Because I think a lot of folks intend to be keeping track of all those things for the business, but it's often not a very well distributed thing. Uh, the second is um, keeping an eye on the category. So if it's, you know, financial services, if it is um, telco, if it's quick service restaurants, if it's any of those types of things, if it exists, there is a publication for it. Um, and keeping eye on an eye on like the work that is happening in the category, as well as sort of like the industry shifts is really helpful for you to be able to formulate a point of view. And this is, again, not just as a creative, but as a sort of strategist, a technologist, any of those types of things as well. And then finally, assuming that most of you guys are going into agencies, but this is applicable on any team, but understanding where the ebbs and flows of the relationships are. So who usually talking to your project management or your account team to be like, who is our client? Where do they sit in the organization? How are we serving them? Those types of things is all uh, really critical. The second uh, or next thing is just to make sure to be, especially when you are a junior, being useful and being proactive is going to be the number one thing that's going to, if you want it, accelerate your career. Um, and I'm not saying necessarily like insert yourself into briefs that you haven't been briefed on and those types of things. Um, I think it's always helpful to first ask permission and to try and frame it around a useful thing. This was very helpful for me, again, when I started at Deutsch, because part of when I started at Deutsch in LA, they were in the middle of a big challenge where they had sort of like, they had traditional clients in uh, Target, Volkswagen, those types of things. And then they had digital clients in um, Nintendo and PlayStation and a couple others. And those were two sides of the agency that didn't talk to each other. So usually my job was playing this like glue situation where I would try to, um, help the target and the uh, Volkswagen clients be a little bit more digital, or I would help uh, the Nintendo side of the team try and be a little bit more uh, traditional and bring different types of things. So oftentimes we would be on a call and this was like early days of social, but we were just sort of making up deliverables as we went along. So I would be like, would it help if I, um, did a competitive social audit to help you guys understand what the space is? Would it be helpful for me to um, pull these types of resources? Would it help for me to comp things for the deck? I think just making sure that you have ways where you're consistently adding value are, are ways to really, again, accelerate your positioning and your standing within an organization and getting you sort of brought in quite quickly. And I think and again, I'm going to caveat more is helpful early on. And this was really helpful for me. So I don't advise to everybody. And I, I probably regret working 80 hour weeks when I was in my 20s, because I've woken up in my 30s. And I'm like, what did I do? <laughs> I feel like I didn't have any fun. But there were, I have to admit that I am where I am, because I did 
more projects, more projects. I, I always signed up for everything. I would walk around to the creative directors to see, you know, is there something that you need help on? But that really did help me accelerate because I was working on twice as many projects that gave me twice as many opportunities to learn and fail. Um, that gave me twice as many teams that I was exposed to, as well as um, twice as much sort of variety so that then when I went on to my next job, I was able to say, oh, I've done this, this, and this type of um, project at the end of the day. And then um, lastly is to ask for feedback early and often. And I think getting into a habit of this, this is still something that I do uh, each and every day, even with my teams, even though I'm a manager, I still um, ask for feedback from my fellow founders and my team. And, and when you have a bad meeting, that progress can feel like the lowest <laughs> moment of your life just in the moment. But I think it's remember to think about the big picture of that where um, over time, you're sort of persistently improving in those things. And if you build that uh, habit in for asking for feedback, you're going to be able to sort of learn and adapt and um, understand what you need to do sort of for next time, uh, if that makes sense. And so then sort of getting into the last period of time, you've gotten the job, you started the job, but how do I really sustain in this uh, career? What are the things uh, that I really need to think and, and worry about? I think it's important to share here that it's not always going to be um, sunshine and roses. I know you guys are in a period of time where it's like, once I get the job, everything will be solved for. And that, like that might not uh, necessarily be true. And I think that's really okay. Um, and, and it's important to know that like com companies are in a constant state of change. There's always going to be people in and out, accounts in and out, and those sorts of things. And one of the big mistakes I made early on uh, was I joined, again, I joined Deutsch. I joined this group that was the invention group. And we had just like, it was one of the best first years in my career where I was like, I'm working on the things I'm working on. I'm work I, I want to work on. I'm working with a team I love. I feel like I'm at a place where we're making great work. And then about a year in, everything changed. My boss left. <laughs> it felt like my world collapsed. They asked me if I wanted to be a manager. And I was like, I don't know. I'm like barely an adult myself. I don't want to do any of these things. Um, and it took me a while to adjust and understand that that's actually something that constantly is happening within the business. So every company you go to is going to be uh, a little bit like a river. You, you don't walk into the same river you walk out of. Um, and, and that's okay. So I think just knowing that that's part of the process and trusting that is really um, key. And I think too, sometimes jobs are not going to be exactly what you expected. So when I left Deutsch, where I had this title of sort of inventionist, I was really focused on being like, I need to figure out how, if I want to be a strategist. Um, I need to go to a place where I can focus just on strategy and boy, was I wrong <laughs> when I, um, I moved my ass over to London to work at a small product innovation studio called Made by Many. And Made by Many worked exactly the way I wanted to work. They always had a team that was comprised of um, a strategist, a designer, and a technologist. And you were sort of the core that was leading the project all the way through. Um, so I was like, this is gonna be a great opportunity for me to just sit down and focus on strategy. But what I didn't realize in that process was going to a small place meant that um, I was gonna wear many hats. So I actually, I thought I was gonna be narrowing in and I ended up diverging out again where I became you know, an account manager or a project manager. I was doing operations and writing scopes of work on top of sort of trying to make sure to learn the craft of uh, strategy on top of it. And I think the important thing here is um, to make sure to sort of trust in that process. Uh, for me, while I was really mad and so frustrated at the time because I was like, this is not the job that I signed up for, the only reason that I was able to be a sort of director of strategy at Deutsch when I came back to Deutsch or eventually became head of uh, strategy at RGA was because I was really good at all of those other things um, because I knew how to scope and plan for projects because I knew what was required of the work to make strategy happen. So again, just trusting in that process is, is really key. And it's not always the job that's going to throw uh, unexpected things your way, um, but sometimes life is going to as well. And, that, and that's also okay too. So we had a situation where 
you know, I was very focused on, you know, we moved from Los Angeles to London. We were really focused on building our life in Europe. We had uh, like a five-year visa on the table and I got a text from my partner one day and it was just like, uh, our, our company is moving to, uh, moving all everything to mainland Europe. We had, uh, 30 days to leave the country. Um, and so there was a choice of like, do we stay and we try and make this happen or do we go? Um, and so everything kind of can get cut short and 180 and really unexpected ways. And I was really lucky because I, um, was able to land on my feet. I was reached back out to the folks at Deutsch. They happened to be the heads of uh, North America by them. And they were like, yeah, come, come to New York and do the exact same thing uh, that you would have done in LA. And, and th there's hard choices to make too. Like I had, a, 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 I was talking to the Wyden and Kennedy Portland office at that time. And I had to make a choice that was like, am I gonna take the job that I really want which is to go to Portland or am I gonna take this job in New York because New York is better for me and my partner. And sometimes those are the choices that you're gonna have to make uh, sort of over time. And I think this was one of those, I don't know if you guys still have Fenske at um, Brand Center, but there, there's a lot of gems <laughs> that you take for granted <laughs> in being at Brand Center where you know the professors will drop knowledge bombs and you just won't even realize it. Um, and this is one that's really just come, continued to come and resonate over time where uh, Fenske would always say to just trust the process and enjoy the process of it. And that's really what it feels like uh, life has come to be sort of over time. And again, those early uh, investments that you make in sort of planting the seeds in your network or planting to the seeds of your career really just absolutely continue to pay dividends over time uh, in the same way that your investment portfolio might. So that, that ex constantly... Um, watered and nurtured and expanded network is always going to come back and sort of pay off for you. So with that, I'm going to leave you guys with 10 takeaways that I've learned. And this has been a really big, if I'm really honest, a year of learning for me um, in terms of like reflecting, thinking about new things. What are the things that um, I wish I'd known when I was younger and those types of things. And I think the first is that bad experiences are just as valuable as the really good ones. Um, I, have, <laughs> I had some terrible bosses um, and they made my life miserable. And, um, and what that really helped me learn to do was when you understand what not to do, that makes it really clear what you should do. And so I think that, not that I think I'm the world's best boss or anything, but I think that really helped me to codify things like my own management style and my own practices. And, and even as we're building Proto, the types of things that we want to cultivate and create rather than um, try and replicate in, in sort of negative ways. I think another thing that I learned is that um, I used to just be mad at everyone all the time. Like, why, why are they not, why do they not want to do the things that I want to do? Why did they not, um, why are they not doing enough? Any of those types of things. And I think it's important to remember um, that everyone's job is an iceberg. Like when you're working with them, you're seeing just like an itty bitty little portion of what they're doing every day. And then they're off and they have their own meetings, their own schedules, their own lives, their own things going on. And I think this was a really big learning for me again, when I transitioned from being a sort of employee or a team member to being a boss. Cause then I suddenly had a lot more empathy for my bosses in the past where I was like, why are they not making time for me? Why did they not are they not doing all of these things? And then I understood they're in a shit ton of other meetings that I have no context or no understanding around. Um, the next one is that, you know, people are always gonna remember in working with you, <laughs> their best experience, their worst experience and their last experience. This is true across all things. I use this uh, phrase a lot in uh, brands and, and customer experience as well. But again, that's one thing where, you know, try to always treat people the way that you would want to be treated. Um, try and always be finding a way to be sort of adding value or be productive in that um, conversation, like losing your temper at work, uh, getting upset or mad at them is, is not always going to be uh, sort of worth it. For me, uh, action is more important than anything else that you know. I'm so glad Danny finds all of my sketches so funny. <laughs> She's just... Uh, cracking up at these. But um, I think one of the things that you'll find a lot is that 
talk is so easy in all of the, this business. It's easy to go to meetings. It's easy to have lots of conversations, but if you leave and you don't do anything with it, that's really what people are going to judge you on and value on value you on at the end of the day. And so for me, making sure that I'm driving things forward or that I'm actually able to take action has always been something that's really important for me. Um, there's also this fact that your career is a marathon and not a sprint. I, um, I feel like I was always rushing to try and get to the next thing. And this goes back to the trust in the process piece with um, Mark Fensky. But I feel like I was always trying to rush to be like, oh, I need to learn how to do the next thing. And I like one of the things that I regret the most is I was getting, you know, when I joined Made by Many, they were in a time of transition. They were going through a lot of change. And I was just like, I feel like I'm not getting all of the things that I want out of this. So I jumped very quickly to another job, maybe after like a year and a half. And the hardest thing is I spent the rest of my career trying to replicate what I was getting at Made by Many. And even in Proto, we're trying to model a lot of the behaviors at Made by Many. And so a lot of me thinks about like, what if I had spent another six months, eight months, 12 months, couple of years there. And even when I went to RGA, I was like, I want this to be a five-year job. Did not do a good job of that, but you know, we'll see. Um, next is to find what really fuels you in this business. I really hope it's not like, can I get Clio's and Andy's and can Lion Awards, or um, can I just work at these big hit shops, but um, really finding what's gonna fuel and, and motivate you. For me personally, and this is gonna butcher a lot of Buddhism, it's the idea of there's sort of two things that you can create for people. You can increase their satisfaction or their pleasure in something, uh, or you can, you can uh, create more suffering in the world. And so my personal mission and you know, the work that I do with clients and the work that I do with team members um, is not necessarily like, what is all of this work going out the door? <laughs> is this uh, deck the most amazing deck that I've ever done? but am I making my team feel satisfied and enjoy the process? And have I done it in the least painful way possible um, for them? And so I think, again, a lot of reflection and uh, understanding of what your own motivations are will be really key to cultivate uh, over time. And I think tied to that <laughs> increasing satisfaction and reducing suffering, I think understanding what uh, the effort is required for you and others to get to good. Um, so the way that I used to talk to my team about this, which is like, was like, you know, is, is this, a, do you just need to like hit the ball or do you need to knock the ball out of the park? Um, and so oftentimes when I'm reviewing work or partnering with teams or those types of things, my goal is really just to make something like 10% better. I'm not trying to rewrite the deck from scratch. I'm not trying to um, do a whole 180. I know that I'm not going to transform a brand tomorrow. Um, and so like, I think just constantly ask yourself and evaluate with yourself, even in the work that you're doing, like, am I going to spend, stay up all night until two in the morning to make this, um, this comp that I'm doing, you know, 20% better, or can I make it 10% better in a few, uh, shortcuts right now and just managing your energy in that way. Um, I think also important is it's really easy to get caught up in the weeds of the work and get caught up in you know the culture of the agency you're at the dynamics of this client oh we're so frustrated with all these things um but i think it's always important to remember to look up and out at what's going on in the world and it'll be really inspiring to you and others i think like there were a lot of things that i started forgetting to do over time like there was there was a point in time when i was in europe where i just forgot to continue to be interested in uh, technology and like what was happening on different social platforms and those sorts of things. And once I got back into it, I was like, oh yeah, this is what I love about doing this job. Um, and the same thing happened when, you know, there was a moment at RGA where I was like, when's the last time I talked about or looked at the work, like, and cared about uh, other advertising that was out there in the world or other uh, experiences people were making. And I think just making sure that you um, take a time to pause and look out at sort of what you're doing and why you're doing it is always really key. And then the last one um, is to listen to your body because it's the only one you've got. Warren Buffett um, has this sort of funny metaphor about it where he's like, 
you know, if you knew that you were going to have one car throughout your entire life, how would you treat it? And everybody in the room is like, well, I'd take it for maintenance all the time and I'd take it for oil changes and do all these things. Um, and then when he's like, well, what if I told you that was your body? Everyone's like, I never thought about it like that. And um, for me, this is just really personal because just in the last year, I had things going all the way back to when I was at Deutsch in Los Angeles where I would feel foggy or I would feel sick or I thought I was tired all the time. And I was just like, oh, I'm just working a lot or oh, I'm all these other things are happening. And um, it, it took until this year, it took 10 years to um, find out that I had an autoimmune disease. And that was actually, and I've started taking medicine and like, it is a night and day difference for how I am feeling. And I can't believe I'm like mad at myself that I've kept from feeling normal for so long. Um, and so just making sure that you like, if you need to take the time to rest, nourish yourself. If you feel like pushing yourself on a project, it's not gonna help the project anymore. Just don't hesitate to set up those boundaries because every time you take it away, you know, again, we've got one life to live and it, it shouldn't start and stop with uh, advertising at the end of the day. So that, my friends, is your, hopefully your first homemade talk. Um, so thank you guys for uh, taking the time. Uh, I hope that this was helpful and useful to everyone. And then, you know, does anyone have any questions? You're getting lots of clap and heart emojis. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you so um, much for being candid and generous with your insights today, but it sounds like someone has a question. So go ahead. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, thanks for speaking. That was a great talk. Um, my name's Charles. I'm a first year XD. I was wondering, like, uh, you mentioned that you kind of exist in this space that's between like design, strategy, and technology. Do you find that the organiz organizations that you work with value um, those new, like the technology you mentioned, like dronifying one of the um, one of the projects that you were doing, was that something that like organizations were excited about, or did you find yourself like advocating for these new or different things? I mean, I thank you for your question, Charles, um, and I love the painting behind you. Um, so I was really lucky that the, the point in time at which I came out of Brand Center was like the iPhone was only a few years old. So everybody was trying to figure out how to make apps for things. I think one of my first projects was making a cow chat app for moms to talk to each other. Like it was bad, um, you know, and social media was also pretty nascent. So I was, I was in a lucky and a pretty privileged position in that I was able, like when I said I was gonna help to translate technology, that was a useful thing for them. I do think too, we're in a really interesting stage of time right now where a lot of what's happened in the last 10 years has sort of like come to fruition, like Alexas are in everyone's house, everything is integrated together. And we're definitely on the cusp of what the next, the new technology wave is going to be around like, I'm pretty sure Apple's going to release a mixed reality product um, by uh, the end of the year. It feels like those are the new paradigms. So I, I do think that every organization now understands and values technology and where you guys will be, always be helpful is in translating what that means for them because most of us groans are grown ups. Sorry, I know that you guys are also grown. Um, like don't have the mental capacity to like, understand, absorb, learn these things in the same way that you guys have over the last few years. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, for sure. Okay. Thank you. I guess I have two questions. One, is that a Kablam lunchbox behind you? It and is. Two, that's amazing. Uh, what do you, where do you see Proto in like the next, like what is like the ideal you know, ecosystem or proto. Yeah, of course. Um, so yes, this is a Kablam lunchbox. It's an old press kit. It has Kablam toilet paper in it. I don't know why. Um, for proto in the next, so we're now at um, probably four months of existence. We have 20 people. Um, we have um, 
I think there's there's this market opportunity that we see as existing for us that I think there's a good opportunity to take advantage of. So it's basically that right now companies go to sort of three different types of agencies to get work done. So they'll go from a strategy and a business strategy perspective, they'll go to McKinsey to be like, hey, McKinsey, what's the future of my business? And the McKinsey will be like, hey, retailer, it's healthcare. Um, and then McKinsey, uh, and then that company will go to a company like IDEO. So from an experience perspective, and they'll be like, McKinsey told us that our future of, as a business is to be a healthcare company. So IDEO help us come up with all those services. And then finally, um, you know, IDEO, IDEO will come up with those ideas and then they might go to a branding agency like a Wolf Olin's or a Lip and Cot. And then they'll be like, we need to figure out how to bring these um, products to market in the world. Um, so right now that's sort of a big sort of baton passing exercise. And we're sort of hoping to be of all of that in a one-stop shop. Um, my goal for us, and, and this is probably just really internally facing is um, right now we're building the plane while we're flying it. Uh, we have a ton of projects. We are so, so lucky, but I also want to build some like stability, some distinctiveness and like, what are the proto artifacts and what are the proto processes that nobody else has and does? Um, I want our teams again, to be really happy and satisfied and rewarded with that work. And then hopefully we'll be able to also have a couple of public projects um, by then, because we definitely have projects going on right now. I hope that answers your question, David. Oh yes, thank you so much, that was wonderful. Yeah. I have a question. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Ryan. I'm a strategist first year. And so just at that, you know, the whole point that you were making about being at the intersection of strategy and design is something that I really resonate with. And I've found that most, you know, there's a ton of crossover between UX and experience design with strategy and most experienced strategists or, you know, people that are at that hybrid started mm -hmm. with a design background and found their way into strategy because of the overlap. But in my case, it's kind of the opposite. So I have the foundation of strategy by studying it, and then I'm interested in the experience design aspect. So do you have any advice on, for a strategist that's trying to get into the design space, how to kind of start to think about things in that way? Yeah, of course. And there's, um, I think there's like a couple of different buckets to think about it from. So like, if you think about big tech companies, tech companies have, um, like UXRs or UX researchers paired with designers all the time. They're almost always working as a team. So for me with strategy, oftentimes that's, um, it, that takes a lot of like the qualitative understanding as well as quantitative work that you've probably learned in Kaylee's classes. And it, it, it enables you to be really close to how you're able to create products. I think if you're looking at trying to apply it in agency world, there's sort of like two buckets that you could think about where that really specifically applies. There's um, like smaller boutique innovation shops like, um, like uh, Artifact or IDEO or those types of things where you're still gonna always be paired with a designer, but you um, might be doing some things beyond just the qualitative research or those types of things. And you might have to do some more in-depth thinking around understanding you know, how the service, either expanding and understanding how the services are going to work or uh, expanding to understand more of the business side aspects to how that business um, proposition is going to get shaped. And then finally, at like big companies like BML YNR or RGA or AKQA, where you might need to expand upon is really depth. And that depth is would be something like if you get brought in as an experienced strategist, yes, you might do some qualitative research, but you might be asked to uh, do content strategies for things. And so that might mean that you have to do really big in depth audits to understand um, how all of that information architecture is architected and those types of things. Um, but I, if you are focusing on like getting involved at a big agency, I think it would be understanding more of um, the technical requirements of things. So I think that's where I would you have three different angles in, which is always good, but they're they're all quite divergent, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely, thank you. Hey, Rachel, on that note, hey, um, you know, you are a polymath, like, you know, one of those people that can cross over from strategy, design and technology, do it um, exceptionally well. Um, 
maybe what is your what have you learned about polymaths in 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 in, in business, uh, especially as organizations try to typecast and 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 put people in boxes? Any thoughts on sort of being a polymath and navigating? Um, you know, a world where people are being asked to specialize. Um, first off, Andrew, I feel like you need to give me your skincare routine because you have not aged. I don't know what's going on. Um, <laughs> but, um, and I'm also really, uh, like, really appreciate the compliment that uh, I'm a polymath. I don't really think so, but I will do my best to answer uh, this question. I feel like it was really helpful to be a polymath in specific contexts. So um, at Deutsch, it worked really well because it was an organization going through change. And in small companies like the Upside made by many and even now at Proto, it's great because I have a lot more flexibility to define um, different things or I can fill in a lot of gaps. I've sort of defined what I do to the other founders as like, I'll be the surround sound, like other people will figure out where they are and I will fit in in the in-between. Um, but where that where I really rubbed up against things was in big organizations where I like at RGA and at um, Deutsch both, I, I the second time around, I sort of ran up into walls a lot of the times where people people don't want you doing their jobs. Um, uh, and, and that's very uh, a very valid point for them. And so I think understanding better the sort of environments that I would thrive in was was key to that. Thanks, Andrew. I just want to note that uh, time is up. And so Rachel, thank you so much for all your wisdom and tactics as we head into recruiter session and finding internships. Uh, I think we'll we'll take a lot from your talk and